Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 187 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Today, we live in an American culture that is obsessed with sports. To give you just two examples, The National Football League sees an average of over 67,000 fans attend each of its games. Major League Baseball sees an average of more than 30,000 fans attend each of its games. And this is to say nothing of the millions of Americans who watch these sports on television or online or listen to them on the radio. Or the millions of Americans who prefer things like hockey, basketball, swimming, and all sorts of other sports. So... How did we become such super sports nuts? And when did the business of professional sports become a thing in the United States? Early American history has answers for us, as does Kenneth Cohen, a curator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History and the author of They Will Have Their Game, Sporting Culture and the Making of the American Republic. Ken's research looks at how sport in early America, events like horse racing, theater, and tavern going, help shape the evolution of American democracy and capitalism. So as we explore sport in early America, Ken reveals what early American sporting culture was and the types of sports early Americans engaged in, taverns, racetracks, and other venues for sport in early America, and details about how the American Revolution impacted the development of sport and sporting culture between the colonial and early republic periods. But first, I have some exciting news. Episode 200 is just around the corner, and the Omohundro Institute and I would like to use this huge occasion to celebrate you. Most podcasts never make it beyond episode 7, but we're really close to episode 200. And I really couldn't have done it all these years without your support. Your emails of encouragement, your ideas about the show, your questions about history, and just your desire to get to know me a bit better have all kept me going. So I want to return the favor and use episode 200 as an opportunity to honor and feature your questions about American history. I've been in our listener community on Facebook, so I know you have lots of questions about early American history, and here's your chance to get them answered. Ask me anything you want to know about early America. And out of these questions, I will select between 6 and 12, you know, depending on their complexity, and the Omohundro Institute's digital projects team and I will track down answers for you and air them in episode 200. And you should really ask me all the questions you have, liz at benfranklinsworld.com, because you just never know. We may just make bonus episodes out of all your questions and, over time, answer them all. So what would you like to know about early America? Let me know. Email me, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. All right, are you ready to discover more about sport and sporting culture in early America? I know I'm ready. So why don't we go meet our guest historian? With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us is a curator in the Division of Culture and the Arts at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. His research specialties include the history of early America, mass culture, political culture, and sports. His book, They Will Have Their Game, Sporting Culture and the Making of the American Republic, explores how horse racing, theater, and tavern going helped shape the evolution of American democracy and capitalism. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Kenneth Cohen. Thanks for having me, Liz. So, Ken, you know in They Will Have Their Game that we can use the early history of sporting culture in British America and the early United States to explore the origins, nature, and limits of democracy in the early United States. And this seems like a really fascinating and important idea, so... I wonder if we could begin our exploration with sporting culture. Would you tell us what you mean by sporting culture and what sport meant in early America? Yeah, that's a great question because it's obviously at the premise of the book. So sporting culture is not a term that was used in the period. It was created by scholars over the last sort of 20 years or so. 
the concept of sporting culture and the term itself is reflective of the ways people grouped a certain set of activities together. Things like horse racing, boxing, gambling games like billiards and cards, theater, prostitution, all of these sorts of acts were sort of lumped together by scholars, as I said, over the last 20 years or so as activities in the period that were discussed in hyper-masculine terms and as a set of activities that were conceived in the period as being related to each other, even though the exact phrase sporting culture wasn't used. So as for sport itself, what I argue in the book is that our definitions of sport today which are generally limiting the concept to physical activity, competitive physical activity. Those sorts of definitions spring from anthropological and sociological studies in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And so they don't get to how the word sport was used in the 18th and early 19th centuries. And if you look at documents from the period, a wide range of documents from newspapers to diaries and letters, you see that sport was used in a much broader sense to refer to sort of enjoyable uncertainty and competition. And in that sense, you can see sport being used in activities that we might not lump under the umbrella of sport today, like theater or prostitution. And so in the period, all of these activities might be connected to or described as a sport, but they weren't generally lumped together as sporting culture. You mentioned that prostitution in theater could be considered as sport in early America. So I wonder, what other types of sport existed during this period? Yeah, there's a wide range of games. And again, anthropologically speaking today, we would say games are not physical events and sport differs from games because sport tends to be physical. But in the period, all sorts of competitive and gambling games were referred to as sports, or if you were playing them, somebody would say, are you sporting or not? Are you embracing the risk and the chance, or are you not embracing that element? So as I said, playing cards, tabletop bowling games, all sorts of dice games, these would all be not necessarily described as sport, but the word sport might be used to describe actually participating in them. So people might not call backgammon a sport, but if you were gambling at backgammon, as many people did in the 18th century, they would say, you know, I had a sporting time playing backgammon. You know, when we think about uncertainty in card games or games of chance today, gambling is what comes to mind. And I wonder, did gambling exist in early America? And was that considered a form of early American sport? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's at the center of what sport meant then. And you didn't have to gamble because you could embrace chance and uncertainty and risk without gambling. And theater is a good example of this. We think of it today as something that's very tightly scripted. But in the 18th century, the audience had a lot of influence on the way any given performance might actually be acted. The audience would demand that actors change lines or that the Musicians play different songs between the acts or even during the performance sometimes. And so there was a much greater sense of uncertainty at the theater. But you're right, the gambling is a real traditional and almost ancient way that this concept gets activated. And so gambling was really common in early America. Early Americans gambled on everything under the sun. I tell the story early on in the book of two different gambling episodes in Philadelphia at the turn of the 18th century, one in which a man has a bet whether or not he can smoke 21 pipes in the space of an hour. And he does, and he wins the bet, but he dies before he leaves the tavern. And in another case, William Byrd, a Virginia planter in the early 18th century, is gambling on how quickly his slaves can cut the ice on the James River near his plantation. So there's all sorts of gambling on all sorts of things in early America. And that's because gambling was loaded with this meaning of trying to prove yourself, right? It's one thing to say something, to assert an opinion, but if you're putting money behind it, that sort of statement of belief, of conviction, that's beyond mere verbiage. And so gambling is a way to sort of freight what you're saying with even greater weight and to show that you know what you're talking about. Like, I'm going to put money on this because I know this is going to happen and you're wrong that it won't. And if I'm right, the exchange of money will show that I was the superior person in predicting and knowing the content that was at stake here. You mentioned that early Americans gambled and played sport as a way to prove themselves to each other and to the public. 
And one of the interesting things I found in your book, They Will Have Their Game, is that sporting culture wasn't all about sports. It was also a form of exerting social control and social hierarchy. And I wonder if you would tell us more about this idea. Right. This is really the crux of the book's argument, right? Sporting culture's use as a social or political tool changes over time. And most importantly, it's negotiated. So it's not something elites can just dictate. And that's precisely because you don't have to go to a sporting event the way you have to buy food or you might feel compelled to go to church. At first, elites think that they can simply win awe and support from the masses for funding these kinds of activities and presenting themselves in secluded or enshrined roles at them. Exclusive box seats are an example, or as an elite and exclusive jockey club that funds horse races. But average people pretty quickly reject this and basically say, look, if you want us to appreciate you for financing this stuff, You need to make it more democratic. You need to make box seats more affordable and accessible. You need to stop staging performances that just make you look good. There's a great example in the Philadelphia theater in the late 1760s where a new theater gets built and there's not a lot of space in the theater. So rather than distinguishing the box seats by giving them a separate entrance or even really a distinctive location in the theater, they just throw up a set of iron bars between the box seats and the gallery seats that are even higher up and were the cheapest seats in the house. And in 1767, a few years after the theater was built, a bunch of Philadelphians break into the theater at night and remove those bars. They refuse to accept a sort of physical separation that the elites are trying to create through more formal sporting practices in the 1750s and 1760s. And this reaction is only strengthened by the revolution and its rhetoric of equality and freedom that really is emerging at the same time. So after the revolution, Elites back off a bit from this and they gradually tie sporting culture to capitalism instead of some form of aristocracy. Sport becomes not just commercial, but a centralized and more heavily capitalized form of business. So the theaters are bigger, the racetracks are bigger, the taverns are grander, and they're financed by investors looking for a financial return instead of being a kind of philanthropically sponsored event. And as a result from that, Sporting events become a kind of proving ground where on one hand, everyone can be confronted and judged because the investors want as many people to go as possible. So they're trying to make every kind of seating section in the theater more accessible. But the flip side of this is that the shows themselves, whether you're talking about sporting events or theater performances, increasingly espouse values of competition and wealth that support the emergence of capitalistic economies. Okay. Now that we have some context for how we should think about sports and sporting culture in early America, I think we should explore sports in early America in more detail. I think we should start with some of the venues for sports. So, Ken, if we could travel back in time to the mid 18th century and we walked into a tavern, what will we see in experience? I mean, what kinds of sporting culture or games might we be able to participate in in this tavern? You know, historians have been writing about and studying taverns for a long time. And one of the points that I try to add to that literature is to say that the answer to that question depends on what tavern you enter, that you can't talk about taverns as some sort of monolithic type of space because there were specific taverns that were targeted to do specific kinds of things. Now, historically, a lot of historians have said that the differences between those taverns are that, you know, some targeted certain kinds of people, whether that's class or race or occupation or what quarter of a city they were residing in. But the evidence I've seen actually suggests that most taverns catered to a very mixed clientele throughout the long period I'm examining. The difference is that the tavern is constructed architecturally, spatially, with the intended purpose of fostering a certain kind of interaction. And then people who aren't really attuned necessarily to the different kinds of tavern spaces that are available might look at the documents or might visit this tavern in the period and say, oh, all these people are behaving badly. They're all the rabble. When in reality, there might actually be erstwhile gentlemen in that group. They're just letting off steam in that space for a certain reason or period of time. And so what you would see when you go in a tavern depends on which tavern you're in. There are places where certain taverns are constructed in ways to foster a very aggressive kind of competition. And there are taverns that are built to foster very polite kinds of conversation. There are taverns that are sort of indoor-outdoor spaces where you're supposed to be using 
the yard and the exterior. And there are taverns that are intended to keep everybody inside and in very small rooms where you're going to be with very small groups of people that would lend itself towards very small parties as opposed to mingling with people you don't know. So again, you know, what you see and which games are played depend on the tavern that you're in. Taverns that have lots of small rooms are unlikely to be able to house a billiard table because billiard tables were 12 feet by 6 feet back in the period. And so in order to also shoot the ball, you need a room that's basically, you know, 16 feet by 20 feet. And that's a pretty big space in an 18th century or early 19th century tavern. On the other hand, if you've got small rooms, you might have lots of backgammon boards because backgammon is a game played by two people and it's not really so much a spectator event as a participatory activity. So it sounds like there was really no one size fits all tavern, if you will. I mean, our tavern experience would really vary by region and even vary by what side of town we were on in a particular city. Yeah. And even more than that, they could vary not even necessarily geographically within a city. You could have a what I call a sporting tavern, a tavern with very big spaces that are intended to foster very aggressive risk taking on one side of a corner of a street. And across the street, you might have a very refined tavern with lots of small spaces that are intended to have very polite parties or at least parties that know each other and are unlikely to get into uh, very aggressive confrontations. Now, you mentioned that after the revolution, men started to focus on sport as a kind of business, as a way that they could make money. What exactly was the business model for the taverns to allow all of this gaming and sport to take place in their rooms? Yeah, so taverns used gaming and had done so since, you know, the 16th and 17th centuries back in Europe. They had used games and sports as a way to keep people on site longer. So the goal is, well, you know, if you're going to play a game of cards or if you're going to play billiards, these games take time. And if you're on site longer, well, maybe you drink two drinks instead of one. Maybe you order some food instead of just having a drink. So they were really a ploy on the part of tavern keepers to keep people around and drinking and eating more. It's kind of funny for me to think about this because I was just in Las Vegas. And when we think about a casino today, we know that they use drinks as a way to keep people gaming longer. And in early America, taverns were using gaming as a way to keep people drinking longer. Yeah, that's right. There's an inversion there. And that has very historical explanation for that sort of evolution. And it has to do with the way casinos evolve over time and the way gambling is taxed and the way, for instance, slot machines have to provide winnings for a certain proportion of winners. And so gambling becomes the mode for the house to make money. And that's really the difference between a casino and a tavern. Casinos come out of taverns, but casinos make their money from the games rather than the refreshments and taverns are the reverse. Okay, and this raises an interesting question. When we think of casinos today, we know that they're highly regulated. We also know that lotteries and other form of gambling are legal today because they have to follow certain rules. Was there any sort of regulation on gaming and tavern keeping in early America? Yeah, a lot. And even lotteries as well in that period. But much like the nature of taverns themselves, the laws varied widely from colony to colony or state to state, and they varied widely over time. In the colonial period, gambling on certain games was illegal, but the prescribed activities varied. Sometimes horse racing was listed as illegal, or billiards could be singled out, but not horse racing. But the key in the colonial period was that every colony, except for Maryland, there's always an exception, right, passed a law that copied a law passed in England in 1710 that said that bets were not enforceable contracts. So in other words, if you make a bet and somebody doesn't pay, you can't take them to court and sue them for that money. So bets aren't legal contracts. That law was passed in England in 1710. And over the course of the 1720s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, every one of the British colonies passes a law that copies that. And these laws are essentially an effort to protect elite wealth by limiting the transfer of large sums of money through gambling. Because not only could you not sue to recover money that somebody chose not to pay, but if you lost, if you actually did pay more than 10 pounds in a gambling loss, you could sue to recover that money. So you couldn't sue if the person didn't pay, but if you did pay, you could sue and get your money back as long as the sum was more than 10 pounds. And so you can see how this kind of law is used to sort of protect wealth and prevent its transference through gambling precisely because gambling was so widespread and was so heavy in both Britain and in America in the 18th and early 19th centuries. We've been exploring taverns and tavern culture, which historically seem to be really male spaces. 
So what about sporting culture for women? Specifically, Beckett and Sally would like to know whether women participated in any tavern games or in any other aspect of early American sporting culture. Of course, women were everywhere in early American sporting culture, and the book talks about women's roles. Ladies sometimes had to stay the night at a tavern because there were no hotels and they were traveling. Some women ran taverns and theaters. A few women even raced horses against men. But men tried very, very hard, particularly white men, tried very, very hard to confine women's roles. So a polite woman might visit a nice tavern, but not one of those really rough sporting taverns, or else she'd be the subject of gossip that might harm her reputation. And there's lots of quotes that I pull out from references in period documents that talk about women's, quote, you know, lacerated reputations for sitting in the wrong section at a theater, for not sitting in the box seats, the most polite and refined section at a theater, for instance, or for attending a tavern that had a poor reputation. White men of all ranks, on the other hand, defined themselves precisely by their increasing ability to be both genteel and polite and ungenteel or raw, rough, manly, whenever they felt the need to go into a space and behave that kind of way. And so lots of venues like theaters and racetracks included spaces for both genteel and ungenteel events under the same roof. But white men tried very, very hard to make sure that women couldn't move between those kinds of spaces the way that they could. And it's not just white women who found this barrier erected. African-Americans, all sorts of non-white peoples found themselves targeted by white men's rules, which were in place to try to give them the ability to move between types of manhood, but restrict everybody else. And this works on a logical level, because if everybody can go everywhere, then how do you know you're behaving genteel or raw or rough? Because everybody's everywhere and no particular space or activity has any kind of coded meaning. But if only one group of people can move and everybody else is sort of restricted, either by rules or by fear of what might happen to their reputation, well then, polite women's presence in genteel spaces makes a white man polite in that space. And then when he moves, when that white man moves to an ungenteel space, it's the very presence of poor white women and non-whites that would announce or declare that this white man is now trying to prove his raw virility. And it's important to recognize that this is an effort that white men make. There's lots of white women and people of color who defy these rules, who test these rules. But the fact that those rules are in place, I think, is important evidence of how sporting culture was seen as a tool for the construction of a republic that would be limited to white men in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Speaking of the ability of people of color to participate in early American sporting culture, would you go into more detail about their participation? Logan would like to know more about the participation of Africans and African-Americans in that culture and whether slavery may have impacted the development of American sports. People of color had all sorts of roles in American sporting culture. They were performers in some cases. They were laborers who might construct the venues or work at the venues. And they were spectators. But their roles as spectators, as we just mentioned, were subject to rules that may or may not be enforced, but were always a sort of barrier of some degree to their full participation in comparison to white men. In terms of slavery affecting sort of the evolution of sporting culture, this is most prominent in terms of the evolution of taverns, because in the North, over the course of the early 19th century, the post-revolutionary period in particular, even starting as early as the 1780s and 1790s, there's a bifurcation of taverns that goes even beyond what it had been in the colonial period so that there are spaces that are rough and aggressive and there are spaces that are refined and polite. In the South, there are a number of venues that persist over time that might hold rooms for doing both types of activities. So I'd mentioned earlier, you know, that racetracks and theaters had both sort of cheap seats and slightly more expensive seats, although still accessible. And it was the way that these spaces were furnished and the materials they were constructed out of that announced whether you were supposed to be polite or you could be more rude in those spaces. And taverns had started out that way. But over the course of the 19th century, they fracture in the north so that polite taverns become entirely separate spaces and rougher taverns become entirely separate venues in their right. But in the south, you find more and more taverns persisting with both types of spaces under one roof. And one explanation for that is that slavery makes 
rougher displays of physical manliness more okay in conjunction with politeness and gentility than they do in the North because white men have to prove their mastery all the time. It seems from our conversation that racetracks were another important venue for sports to take place in early America. And this is confirmed by the details in Ken's book, They Will Have Their Game, where we discover that in the 1740s, many wealthy men turned to thoroughbred racing as a form of sport. Ken, Marie would like to know more about horse racing in early America. So would you tell us more about the history of the sport in colonial British America and then in the early United States? Horse racing was by far the largest spectator sport in early America from the 1720s, 30s, all the way up to the 1850s and 1860s. There are exaggerated, undoubtedly exaggerated reports that announced crowds in the 1820s of the 50 to 60,000 range. But even realistically, there are accounts that note, you know, 10 to 20,000 people at major racetracks for big races in the early 19th century. And in America, horse racing starts off as mostly quarter horse racing which is down a straightaway. It could be a road or it could be a path specifically built for racing. And the path was usually straight and ran for a quarter or a half a mile. But because most of the horse stock in British America was shared, poor men could end up with as good a quarter horse as rich men. And so thoroughbred racing is really a tool that the American colonial elite uses to separate themselves from the masses of horse owners. So in order to be a thoroughbred, and this is true even still today, your thoroughbred racehorse has to have its lineage traced back to the three original foundation sires from North Africa, Arabia, and Turkey. And in the 18th century, before the thoroughbred racing had had hundreds of years to develop, having horses with that lineage was rare. And of course, they had to be certified, so it was a process. So those horses were very expensive. And in addition, those horses had greater running endurance then they had brute speed. And so that also makes them different from quarter horses. So thoroughbred racing in the 18th century are races of three to four miles, and you race best two out of three. So a thoroughbred horse in the 18th century might end up running 12 miles in a day. You can compare that to the Belmont Stakes today, which is the longest triple crown race in the U.S. today. And that's one event at a mile and a half. So thoroughbred racing in the period was really a way that elites were able to separate themselves and their kind of racing from the way other Americans might race their horses. And then what happens over time is commercialism and capitalism and the potential to make money from these horses drives owners to breed even thoroughbreds for speed so that the distances of those races begin to shrink over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries until you get to the shorter events we have today. You know, we should go back to something you mentioned earlier, which is the impact the American Revolution had on early American sport. Now, we know that the American Revolution disrupted and changed a lot of the politics, culture and economics of colonial British America. So in what specific ways did the American Revolution impact and change early American sporting culture between the colonial period and the new republic? So the revolution is crucial to helping give non-elite Americans a sort of grounding for their resistance to the effort on the part of elites in the 1750s, 60s, and 70s to formalize sport into some way that would sort of prove their superiority. And so elites do this not only through thoroughbred racing, which we just mentioned, but by building new theaters, by building all of these different kinds of spaces, right? You remember the theater where they had tried to separate the boxes with iron posts. So these are all efforts to try to use sporting culture to assert some kind of social distinction or social superiority. And of course, the people who don't get included in that club resist it right from the outset. Who knows if they would have succeeded or not without the revolution, but the revolution definitely helps them succeed because it generates a rhetoric of equality and democracy and inclusion and sort of mass action that supports the kinds of resistance that was already going on in sporting venues. And here I think the timing is really important to note because lots of people have used sporting culture as a mirror to say that it reflects what's going on in a given period. And that's certainly true. But I would go even further and say that sporting culture is an agent. It helps shape history, not just reflect it. And part of the evidence for that is that people were resisting 
genteel or gentrified sporting events before the revolutionary movement and the resistance movement really gets going in the wake of the Stamp Act. And then the Stamp Act and subsequent moments of resistance and then revolution sort of feed off of and then refuel resistance in sporting venues in a sort of mutually reinforcing fashion. Would you give us an example of the pushback against sporting culture during the American Revolution so that we can see the impact the revolution had on a particular sport? Yeah, so I can use theater in this case. There's, you know, a dozen or more newspaper reports, which is sort of a lot given what we're talking about, of audiences in the early 1760s, starting even in the late 1750s and moving up through 1762 and 63, of audiences in the galleries throwing vegetables and refuse at wealthier people in the boxes or shouting epithets at them, interrupting the performance in order to make some sort of comment that was intended to sort of take elites down a notch and criticize gentility as something that could be elite and exclusive. And so that whole sort of trend that is being written about in New York and Philadelphia newspapers in the 1750s and 1760s, and by the way, it's often written by elites who are sort of chastising non-elites for having done this, that they don't know how to behave in a theater and this isn't what they're supposed to be doing. But all of these articles are evidence that the kind of anti-elitism triggered by what was going on in sporting culture provided a kind of framework that then gets drawn upon during the American Revolution. So most famously during the American Revolution, the colonists in the wake of the Stamp Act burned down the New York theater. And they do it while attacking people wearing genteel trappings, wigs, nice coats, things like that. And that is sort of taking to the nth degree what already had been happening at theaters. But then that attack on the theater gets organized by the Sons of Liberty in order to sort of fuel resistance and patriot ends. Something interesting I found in Ken's book, They Will Have Their Game, is that The revolutionaries' anti-elite leveling attitudes toward sport and theater didn't really seem to last long. It seemed like genteel sporting culture really made a comeback after the revolution. And this is something I'd like for us to explore just after we take our moment to talk about our episode's sponsor. Summer is nearly upon us, which means many of us are getting ready for warmer weather, a chance to switch up our work routines, and for our summer vacations. If you're like me, summer vacation is a time for road trips and summer reading. And do you know what makes the perfect companion on these summer road trips? Audible. Because Audible has an unmatched selection of audiobooks and original audio shows from the leading audiobook publishers. Plus, if you're like me, you'd like to continue reading after you're out of the car for the day. I mean, you just want to know how the story ends. Well, Audible has you covered. Did you know that with Audible, you can switch seamlessly between listening and reading without ever losing your place? This means you can both listen to and read a book like Gordon Wood's The Creation of the American Republic. This is just one of the many titles available on Audible, and it's a classic work of early American history. Wood's book allows you to discover the origins of the political system we have here in the United States by taking you through the evolution of American political thought from the Declaration of Independence to the ratification of the Constitution. Well, you can listen to Wood's book through the Audible app while you're in the car, driving to your destination, and then when you arrive at your destination, you can continue reading the book on your Amazon Kindle, right where the audiobook left off. And the same process works in reverse. So if you're reading Wood's book on your Kindle, you can get back in your car, fire up the app, and Audible picks up right where you left off your reading. Pretty sweet, huh? I love this feature. And Audible wants to give you the opportunity to try it out for yourself. Audible is offering you a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just visit audible.com slash bfworld so you can browse Audible's unmatched selection of audio programs and download a book that strikes your fancy for free. It's that easy. Go to audible.com slash bfworld or text bfworld to 500-500 to get started today. So Ken... Would you tell us just how genteel sporting culture made a comeback after the revolution during the early republic? What shifted the public's opinions was that the elites who were financing sporting events started to finance them and build venues 
differently from the way they had done it before. So in the colonial period, elites sort of built racetracks and theaters, for example, relatively philanthropically. All they were looking for back was their original investment. They weren't looking for a return on their investment. All they wanted was the amount that they had put out as a loan to build the structure. After the American Revolution, they are investors who are looking for a rate of return. And while on the one hand, it's certainly true that this means that investors have become greedier, this also actually satisfies the public. Because in the colonial period, this sort of beneficent funding of sporting events was looked upon as aristocratic, that elites were doing this in order to establish their superiority and demonstrate their ability to provide for the community in a way that would then sort of entrench their power. But by making sporting events commercial, elites argued, they were turning them into events that could fail or succeed just like any other business. And so the public would get to determine whether sporting events succeeded or failed. It wouldn't just be elites deciding that the public wanted this kind of event. And so it's sort of presented as, and in fact, it actually is a more commercial mode that emerges after the revolution that gets the public interested again in participating in these sporting events. And I should say, even during the revolution, it's not that the public wasn't interested in participating in sporting events. That interest is present consistently. The question is, how interested are they in participating in sporting venues where gentility might also be asserted? And in order to be interested in that, they want gentility to be accessible and they want to be able to criticize it. And these commercial venues afforded them the opportunity to do that better than ones that were more sort of philanthropically funded. So it sounds like genteel sporting culture made a comeback during the early republic because American society and the economics of the culture had changed. I mean, Americans' views on the elite and their gentility didn't change so much as they wanted a more democratic form of sport and its commercialization during the early republic allowed for this. That's an interesting point. I think those are really closely related because gentility was a concept that was so important to how elites were trying to justify that they deserved political power or how they had superior ideas for making and spending money. So gentility is wrapped up in how elites sort of justify both their wealth and their pretensions to political power so that I think it's hard to sort of split the wheat from the chaff on that argument. Now, I'm really curious about the sources you use to study sport and sporting culture in early America, because today we can watch sports on television or listen to them on the radio or do both through an app, or we can even attend those games in person and take all sorts of pictures of them. So today, our record on sports consists of video, audio, some print, and a lot of other visual sources. But this type of visual media didn't exist during the 18th and early 19th centuries. So what kinds of records did you use to reconstruct what sport and sporting culture look like in early America? Like historians who have studied this subject before me, there's actually a lot written in newspapers. Just like in the newspapers today, there's a sports section. There wasn't a sports section back then, but sporting events were covered and were discussed at length. And there's a lot of advertisements for sporting events, you know, try to get people to come to them. So you can look at the language used in those kinds of texts. What I tried to do was sort of take that foundation of evidence and seek out additional forms of evidence that folks hadn't necessarily considered before. And that largely took two forms. The first is business evidence, financial accounts, which could be in account books. They can be in loose scraps of accounts that are sort of tucked in with manuscript paper collections at archives. They can be in letters. And so I was able to find quite a few individual investors who had actually kept pretty good records about their investment in sporting events through letters, through entries in account books, and through loose accounting scraps. And you can piece together, if you take these over a large span of time and over a wide swath of space, you know, I saw patterns emerge in terms of how these events were being financed, what kind of return was being expected from the investor, how they were anticipating meeting those expectations of return. So the financial information provided one set of new evidence, if you like, that could be layered on top of the newspapers. The second set is architectural evidence, and this is either descriptions or visual productions of entertainment spaces, or as you get into the early 19th century, fire insurance records, which detail specifically what the spaces were made out of and what kinds of formal finish were built into the spaces. 
And so what I saw was that the spaces in terms of how many doors you had to pass through to get to elite seats and how separate different entrances for different seating sections at racetracks and theaters were, those sorts of things change in lockstep with how the financing changed. And so the book is organized in three basic sections, and each section moves chronologically but starts with the financial story of how these events are financed and then moves into how those spaces were actually used, what the evidence tells us about the actual use of those spaces, which then triggered a revision to how things are financed, right? So in the colonial period, elites tried to build these nice genteel spaces, but the public didn't like that. And they responded angrily toward that. So then elites responded by making things more commercial and accessible. And then the public accepted those spaces more. So the sort of negotiation that takes place between the people who are generally wealthy and funding these events and people from a wide range of backgrounds, both economically, racially, and in terms of gender, who are using these events, not necessarily in the ways they are originally intended, which then therefore pushes the funders to revise their financing scheme. So Ken, before we move into the time warp, I'd like for us to address the major point of your book, which is that sports help shape the evolution of American democracy and capitalism. And we've talked about this idea throughout our conversation, but I really want us to take a moment to be explicit about it. So how do you see early American sporting culture as shaping American democracy and capitalism? So I think sporting culture is vital to understanding how American democracy came to not just be about the right to vote, but about a chance to move up through hard work and competition. Those sorts of values aren't just a result of sort of the Protestant work ethic or the Constitution or Adam Smith. It's a result of daily experiences of negotiating across lines of class, race, and gender at sporting culture venues over time. Okay, let's jump into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if revolutionary leaders had not taken such a negative stance towards sports during the American Revolution? If they had had a more positive view of sporting culture, how would sports and sporting culture have developed differently in the United States? Here's what I want to think maybe would have happened. I I wish I could say it would have resulted in a failed revolution, right? That the patriots would have been divided over class lines in a way that prevented a unified sense of purpose. And by the way, I want to be clear that I want to think that's not because I don't think the revolution should have happened, but purely because I think sporting culture actually mattered that much. I mean, the history of why sporting culture sort of gets banned for a period in the revolution is often tagged to Americans being criticized by the British, that the British are saying, oh, you know, you're complaining about all of these regulations we're putting on you, but how bad can it be if you've got all these theaters and you're running all these horse races? I mean, the newspapers in Britain actually print that critique. And so the revolutionary ban or prescription on sporting events that's passed by the First Continental Congress in 1773 is in many ways a reaction to that. But I think there's also something more going on, because at that exact moment, in addition, patriot elites were facing resistance from artisans and workers, not in their sort of class group, who were organizing their own political manifestations of the patriot movement. And so because sporting culture was a place where class could be attacked, it became important, I think, for the Congress to prescribe those activities, not just in order to counter British criticisms, but also to sort of cut off at the source one of the places where class divisions amongst the patriots were manifested. Ken, now that you've explored sports and sporting culture in early America, what aspect of history are you researching and writing about now? So I'm looking into the evolution of fame and celebrity using a bunch of new digital history techniques to examine the use of language, words like fame and celebrity celebrated over time as well as the accumulation of museum collections, which were often acquired because of their connection to something famous. 
And so I'm looking at this over a long span of time, and I'm interested in sort of transcending traditional notions of period and periodization. Anyway, I want to end the research project with the rise of halls of fame in America at the turn of the 20th century, and largely because the United States has dozens more halls of fame than most other countries do. And so I think that's a phenomenon that can help us understand what we view as ideal and what we view as a model for who we want to be. As your curator of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, and we already have you on the line, are there any exciting exhibits or exhibitions coming up that we should be aware of? So we've got a new show that actually just opened last summer on the history of American democracy. We have a wonderful show about the history of immigration called Many Voices, One Nation. We've got upcoming shows on a range of events that actually strangely involve sporting culture. So if you're a sports fan, you might find sports in very unusual places in the building. For instance, we have a show coming up on the history of the Elephant Conservation Act, which was passed 30 years ago next year in 1989. But one of the big reasons for the massacring of elephant populations in the 19th century was to produce billiard balls. Billiard balls were probably the second largest consumer product to come out of elephant tusks. So really interesting stories here that are provocative in ways that you might not expect. And then down the road in 2020, we have a big show about the history of American entertainment opening. And so obviously, I'm really excited about that and hope lots of the listeners will come see us. And how can we contact you if we have any questions about sport and sporting culture in early America or even about the Smithsonian's exhibitions? through my biography page that you can access on the National Museum of American History's website. All you got to do is Google my name and NMAH and you should come up with the page and you can hit the little ask me button and I'll get your comments. I'll look forward to them. Kenneth Cohen, thank you so much for helping us explore sports and sporting culture in early America. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Sporting culture was not a term that early Americans used. But it is a term that scholars use to describe the ways early Americans grouped certain sets of activities together, like horse racing, boxing, billiards and cards, theater, and even prostitution. And as Ken noted, these were all activities early Americans considered as sport because they all constituted competitive activities. And this is quite a different view from how we think about sports today. Early Americans considered any enjoyable activity that contained a certain amount of uncertainty and competition in it to be a sport. But today, we think of sport as consisting really only of physical activities like baseball, basketball, football, tennis, or swimming. Of course, we also know sports is a professional and commercial activity. We pay for tickets that get us into ballparks, stadiums, and arenas, so we can watch those who are at the top of their various competitive levels compete. And I don't know about you, but when I go to watch the Boston Red Sox at Fenway Park, I sometimes buy a hot dog or some peanuts from the concession stands, and at least once a season, I purchase a new shirt, hat, or sweatshirt with the Red Sox logo on it to replace something that is faded or worn out. These activities and purchases all constitute additional ways for me, the fan, to support the business around professional sports. Well, this notion of business models and commercialization around sports was basically unheard of before the early republic. As Ken noted, Elites in colonial America usually built a place for sport to take place, you know, like a theater or racetrack, as a civic or philanthropic gesture. The exception, of course, would have been taverns, where tavern keepers use sport as a part of their business strategies to help keep patrons in their establishment longer in the hope that they would buy more food and drink. Now, it wasn't until after the American Revolution that sport and sporting venues developed into businesses. And they developed this way because Americans wanted to decide whether a sporting venue would succeed or fail by their patronage. They didn't want the elite to dictate what sorts of competitive activities they should enjoy. They wanted to decide this for themselves. If they didn't want to watch horse racing or boxing, then they could stop patronizing the track or the tavern and the business owner would have to learn that they just needed to develop a new competitive activity to keep their customers coming back. Now, as Ken revealed, This is an illustration of the democratic nature of sport in the early republic at work. And it's an illustration of how we can better understand American democracy by exploring sporting culture. American democracy isn't just about the right to vote. It's an idea that offers Americans the chance to move up in the world through hard work and competition. And we can see this idea at play when we look at the experiences early Americans had over time as they patronized taverns and sporting venues 
as they watched and participated in the games of their choice, and as they negotiated the boundary lines of class, race, and gender in all those places and around those events. You can find more information about Ken, his book, They Will Have Their Game, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 187. Audiobooks make great sidekicks for your summer road trips and activities. Audible has an unmatched selection of audiobooks and original audio shows, so why not give Audible a try? I mean, Audible wants to give you a free audiobook and 30-day trial for free, so why not take advantage of it? Visit audible.com slash bfworld or text bfworld to 500-500 to start your free trial. Again, visit audible.com slash bfworld or text BFWORLD to 500-500. Production assistance for this episode came from my Omohundro Institute teammate, Holly White. Thank you, Holly. Finally, what did you find most interesting about the world of early American sport and sporting culture? I'd love to know. So send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember... Never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.